Hey guys, this is Kendra. This is Jessica. And you're listening to Lucid, Lucid Lab. Lab. So we're back for we're back. episode number four. And it's your turn this week. Yes, it's my turn. And I'm going to take you guys somewhere we haven't been just yet and do a little true crime. Nothing better than a little true crime. Yep, that's how we got together. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Stuff. <laughs> this is our first that's true we, crime episode yeah, then. That's so how that'll we be connected. exciting. So how are you? Doing pretty good. Yeah. I, yeah, I got to edit this week. Mm-hmm. So I got to learn all the ins and outs of doing that and realize that I need to stop saying um and like so much. I said that last time too. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to try and be better today. I'm so glad that you're editing because in the beginning, I really did think that I was going to be doing a lot of the editing just because of our setup here. And then we figured it out. And now that she's going to edit too... It makes this feel so much more doable, so much more balanced and and allows us to, you know, spend more time researching because we can split the workload more. So, yeah, I think we already have a good set balance on how we're going to handle everything week to week. And so, yeah, we're excited. This is kind of the first week of being in the groove of doing it that way and how we're going to switch off. And so, yeah. And so we're becoming professionals. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not quite yet, but we are feeling more confident in what we're doing and how to get set up up and edit but what have you been up to this week mm, same old same old I'm kind of boring in my daily <laughs> life Kendra's so much more exciting than oh me. I was not exciting this week either <laughs> you know just podcast stuff really you know it's taken over a lot of <laughs> yeah, it's taken over but I like it you know we I like do doing this I wish I felt a little bit better today yeah all you human beings out there with uteruses can relate started today and I have excruciating pains. Oh. My periods are not fun, but I didn't want to cancel. And here we are I'm recording so and I have a heating <laughs> pad on. <laughs> and it's my turn to talk too. So if you hear like some whimpering at some point, <laughs> that's just, that's just me and my monthly flow. It so, happens. Sorry. We've all been there. Unfortunately, it's just part of like you said, having a uterus. I'm just glad it's not combined with migraine right now and I can be here and it's just not feeling good, just feeling yucky. Yeah. Yeah. But did you do anything else? Because you're always planning trips. What's the next one? (laughs) I actually, yeah, that is the one thing. I went out Monday night to meet up with some parents because I am planning a trip to New England. That's right. I want to go. So (laughs) I have this goal in life to visit every single state in the United States and I have eight Eight left and six of them are in the New England area. So I'm planning a trip, like a road trip. We're going to fly into Baltimore mm-hmm. and then drive all the way up to like Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, all the little New England yeah. states. And and then I will only have Alaska and North Dakota left. I've been to Alaska. Alaska is beautiful. Someday I, I will go there. Yeah. yeah. There's I've, not much in North Dakota, so I have to figure out a good reason. If any of you guys are from North Dakota, <laughs> let me know some I would good say things to do there. The scenery is really I've the reason. Beautiful. Yeah. I have not been anywhere close to the amount of places that Kendra has been. She's quite the little traveler. And I'll get there someday. I do someday. enjoy traveling. So what are some of the places you are going to go? So we are going to visit Philadelphia. And there's, I think it's the East Penitentiary. Ooh. I probably said that wrong. It is known to be haunted. We're going to go to the Lizzie Borden house. Yeah. Uh, Salem. A few other little places that I found. One in New Hampshire. It's like a haunted hotel. And there's a place in Vermont, a haunted covered bridge that we're going to go to. Okay. And then there's a triangle in Vermont, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but it's similar to the Bridgewater Triangle that's yep. in Massachusetts area. So it's going to cover at some point. One day. So you, I don't know. You maybe. said Amityville, right? Oh, yes. How could I forget Amityville? Which I'm also covering. <laughs> yes. So you have to take a bunch of pictures. Yeah, definitely. I'm not going till July. So anybody listening to the podcast, give me some ideas of other places to visit while I'm up there. We're going to be there for 15 days and we're going to end in New York City and go nice. see some Broadway shows. Nice. Uh, I think we're going to see Sweeney Todd. That's cool. <laughs> uh, Josh Groban just started yeah, he's gonna be the star of it so. that's right you told me who's doing that that's mm-hmm. so cool so I'm I'm getting excited that's why I'm not doing much right now because I have to save up all my money <laughs> to afford to travel <laughs> this summer uh, but yeah that's all I was up to this week editing and planning trip and and now we're here yeah we're here again. Yeah. Speaking of money, I mean, it's just been hasn't been fun. Like I had this like real moment a few days ago. I think a lot of people can relate with like gas prices and things. Oh and God. I just had this day where everything seemed to be going wrong. I had no gas. 
my oil light came on. Things were just hitting me left and right. When it rains, it pours kind and of I was a thing. kind of sitting there waiting to get gas. I was in line because I was going to this place up here that they actually do have cheaper gas than anywhere else. But because of that, you have to wait in line. Yes. <laughs> And I was waiting there, actually going through all my money, like just figuring out, okay, how can I actually pay for this mm-hmm. gas right now? Oh, man. And, you know, with the oil change that I knew I had to get, and it, I was just trying to figure it all out. And after leaving, I just had this moment of driving and I'm like, uh, you know what? I trust the universe. And right when I said that, two geese flew overhead, but at the same time crossing the road was an owl. And I an just, owl in the middle an of the owl. day? They crossed wow. each other on the road right in front of me. I take that as a sign that you're going to have you my should. back. <laughs> so well, it's going to be fine. Today moment. is not a good day, but yeah, good things are coming. It's been a week and then I wake up and my pain is like, hi, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, not the day, not the day. Thank you. So I'm trying not to be depressing. No, you won't be. (laughs) I mean, we're talking about murder and crime today. (laughs) We'll try to make it not depressing. (laughs) Maybe they'll put me in a better mood here in a second. Yeah. Isn't it funny? The things that actually put us in better moods are things that other people would find as like disturbing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, this one's not like too crazy, so I'm not too worried about it. It's just an interesting case. And yeah. oh, yeah, I forgot to say something. Hi, Elizabeth. We finally got permission to say oh, your name yes. on the podcast. We brought her up in the first episode because she's how uh, Kendra and I met. Yes. Here's your, I don't know, 10 Claim seconds fame. of fame <laughs> <laughs> for now. Yes. So we might bring her up again in, yeah. in the future because we all hang out quite often. Yeah. Yeah. So I spent the last two days, I should almost be embarrassed to say this, but oh, what? <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I love a lot of really serious shows and like I watch, you know, the critically acclaimed shows, but I also have this secret, I guess, pleasure of watching <laughs> trashy reality TV. Oh, okay. Do you watch any reality TV? I don't watch much trashy reality TV. Well, I used to. I don't know. Something changed to me the last couple of years. Doesn't mean I won't sit there like if you want to put it on and watch it. But yeah. I don't. I'm not up to date with any of that stuff. Oh, right now. yeah. <laughs> I don't watch all of it. Like I've never been in the Kardashians or anything no. like that. But I got sucked into Love is Blind back in 2020 <laughs> when it first came out. And I can't stay away. There's so many memes out there. And I'm like, I don't need to watch it. But then I see something on TikTok or Instagram. And I was like, OK, it's crazy. And there's just these two girls that are kind Kind of labeled the mean girls oh, and no. so there's some real interesting drama this season and I, I can't like, stop watching it's like watching a train wreck I feel like I watched maybe the first season is there much interaction between do the girls like live together yeah, otherwise like, oh yeah okay. so all the girls are together and they're all dating the same guys and, oh okay yeah so you can see, can see how, how that would be some drama <laughs> and then you know they don't see each other at all in the beginning right and they form connections you know but they choose who they ultimately want but then there's always this big pool party where they get to see the people they didn't choose oh. Oh. And so, as you can imagine, that's a lot of drama waiting to happen. It's so. the difference between choosing because it's based on like trying to fall in love by just talking to them. Yeah, but I don't know. Like, there's a lot to attraction, right? You could yeah. be in love with someone's soul, but if they don't, no, yeah. And that it's not even about physical. looks. It can be about what if they have bad breath? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, there's little things like or that. You don't like yeah, their smell mm-hmm. because that's like you know, there's so much to chemistry outside of loving someone you know heart and soul yeah there is because it's it's all those other little things that will start to build up and like get on your nerves over time or they have like weird you know ticks or whatever yeah just (laughs) and so some of that has happened but I won't go on and on I'm sure there's some of our listeners out there who watch it and if you are looking for a guilty pleasure I highly recommend you recommend love Love is blind Blind. I'm still not gonna watch it I'm too I'm too busy to have yeah. anything like that on. I but I do like like the deeper shows, you know. Me too. So Love is Blind is something that I can watch while I'm doing other things. Yeah. Versus other shows like I need to be fully engaged. Like paying attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of shows, but I finished the last of us recently that's really good yeah that one's a really good one i like all the hbo shows they put so much time and Mm -hmm. effort and money into their productions Mm -hmm. as far as like something strange for me this week i think i had my very first experience with a glitch in the matrix and it's a crazy one like other things have happened to me before 
where I'm like, I'll question it for a second. But this one's huge. And it took okay. me like a minute to think, no, like this can't be it. And, and so I'll tell you a little bit. There's yeah. this guy that I'm friends with on Facebook and okay. it's from my hometown. And like I recognize his name, but I don't remember him in particular. OK, he's this bodybuilding guy and he's just always posting pictures of this progress and stuff like that. And he's liked some of my posts. And so I've just been aware of him, I would okay. say, over the last couple um, of years. And then one day his account was taken over by his brother and his brother was letting everybody know that he had been in a really, really bad accident and he was in critical condition and stuff like that. Wow. And I just remember it being, it was either Thanksgiving or Christmas of last year that this was happening because I just remember feeling sad for his family that well, this was all happening at this time. And, you know, over a couple of days there were more updates from his brother, um, but sadly he passed away. And then oh. over the next, you know, couple months I saw just posts from family and like his brother updating everybody on where the services were going to be and uh -huh. you know memorial things and people were posting on his Facebook you know as since it's like, this, we like miss living you, thing right. now that people can go back to every now and then and he it was just littered with everybody you know wishing he wasn't gone and all this stuff mm -hmm. and then over the last few weeks I started to notice that there had been posts and at first on the same account on his account and at first I was like I get that his brother misses him or whatever right but it was just weird that they seemed more like normal posts and I was like yeah that's a little weird that his brother's still continuing to use his account mm -hmm. it's been a couple months you know he's he's gone but it doesn't I don't know so I didn't think much at first and then a few days ago I saw a post again from his account and I was like why does that seem just like a normal like he's just like I'm out post. bodybuilding again yeah, it post? was just a weird normal post. And so I clicked on it and that's exactly what it was. He's like, hey, dudes, look at this, you know, na, na, na. And so I start scrolling through his posts and I'm like, they're all just normal. Like, There's nothing that was even suggesting that it was his brother posting them either. That's so I weird. went more and more down the rabbit hole and I got all the way into last year. Nothing about him fucking dying. Nothing. What the fuck? Nothing. He is alive and well and doing everything. He never fucking died. But and I tried to look for evidence of was that like a really sick joke but I'm did you have a dream like no oh, I had so months of watching these posts come up whenever I'd go on Facebook having to do with him or whatnot and and I remember even feeling really really sad for like a week because even though I didn't really know him it was it was a young person it was taken, this guy yeah. yeah and I was like god he worked so hard to get to where he was and it was just he was just gone just like that like right. you know those types of things like really make you think and mm -hmm. he's fucking alive I, I don't know what that makes to no think and Other his brother brother still on there like the brother his brother is not even on there anywhere okay that's weird and like he and I share a lot of the same friends so it's not like he's just this random person yeah like people I know would have been like you dick like why'd you pretend you were dead or like you know I saw nothing of those nothing of that and I went back over a year do you think someone stuff. like hijacked his no because even all of the same people are like you would think he would say something that's not exactly like yeah somebody took my it, there was nothing Facebook. joking about it it was like family talking on these posts of him dying and like all the condolences and all this stuff and okay it's that's... just not there he's alive super strange so all I can think of is now I'm in a reality where he didn't die so it makes you wonder like, how many realities are there if really the you're only noticing one massive thing that changed but then it makes you start to think well what else in my life is glitching changed <laughs> but I'm taking it as, it as it is you know hmm. I don't know it's, it's kind of very freaky. strange I've been like just laying there trying to think if I th can think of anything different yeah that maybe isn't how I remember it like right now there's only one and it's because someone brought it up what's that do you remember Bob Barker yeah from the Price is, Price right. is right I used to watch him when I would stay home from school <laughs> sick I very clearly remember him dying as well I do too he's not dead yes he is but someone said he's not dead he's alive I'm looking it up right he now. just retired and that's why Drew took over he's 99 years old alive see you thought he died too he's still alive according to Wikipedia see but I very clearly remember him dying like who else <laughs> who else is who else do we think is dead and is actually alive right now? It makes me want to go look at a bunch of people that I know of that died over the last 10 years. So the question is, are we all living in a simulation? Well, I think it's a simulation regardless, but I think that there are multiple, multiple realities. The thing is, is do they work the way our brain thinks that they work? Like how many, right. you know, I don't know. Okay. Dude, dude from my high school's alive, Bob Barker's alive and they died. I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> like my brain is 
fried right now. I'm sorry. But, but I have something funny I have to tell you because okay. while I was Good. looking up Bob oh. Barker, <laughs> I got a text from Elizabeth. Oh. Anyway, she texted me and she said, OMG, love is blind is casting in Denver. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wouldn't go on it. It's not what Hell I would want to no. do. No, thank you. I don't want everyone seeing me in a bikini. I would never do any of those. The only one, I, the only reality one I said I would ever do, I would love to do is The Amazing Race. <laughs> yeah, that one was pretty cool. I used to watch that yeah. back in the day. I don't mind traveling and doing all those different. I yeah, know, I like games really cool. and having to figure things. It's just like a big scavenger hunt. I could totally get into that. But I don't want to live with people and have it aired. So I don't want to date in front of everyone. I'm already awkward I wouldn't even do I wouldn't even do big brother that's what I'm saying like I don't want to do one where I'm like living with other people and no everything I do is on camera like that no not at all I'm too private even though I'm doing this (laughs) I know but nobody private sees what we're doing in our off time we're still giving ourselves in a way true to the world I am sharing more here than I seriously like I don't even want people I know to listen yet until it's like on I agree I don't want people to hear what we're doing until we actually submit it and then I'm like it's out there and, and then I want people to what you, what you want. I, I want people to come up to me and be like, Kendra, are you doing a podcast? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, I am. Remember when like you said something about you don't know us, but we're pretty woo. I think it's we're gonna weird. Be, <laughs> yeah, I think whoever we are, like in our own time, is always going to be way different than what we are on here. Yeah, it's not like yeah. we're being fake on here at all. Like this is no. If anything, this is more me. Agreed. This to is be just, honest. Yeah, it's just a side perhaps that isn't coming out. You know, when we're at a social event. Or, or you're just work, talking to the people you just talk talking. to every day. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you don't know unless they're a close friend of yours. And even then, it's like some some friends. Some friends do and know it's, certain parts of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's I who agree. you are with that person. So it's true. There's only a few people that you're ever your whole self with. I would say. I agree. Even with family members. Oh, even more so with family members. There's I'm few even people. More private. There's few people who have who know and have all of me. My mom's definitely one of them. I've talked about her a couple of times on here, but I just have to say I. I love you, mom. Aw. I'm sorry. I love you. All right. So should we get into it? I think so. Let's All jump right. in. So I am covering the case of Scott and Yarmola Philater. Have you heard of them? I have not. Well, I'm hoping to say her name correctly. because Yarmola? The, yeah. So I think in the beginning I was saying like Yarmila, but I looked it up and it is Yarmila. Okay. I don't want to say it wrong just I because know. she's, sadly, she's the victim in this. Oh, I didn't no, we definitely want to get it right then. But it's an interesting, interesting case. Um, it's baffled many people for a really long time because until this day, the motive is not clear. Okay. We can still only speculate and make our own personal conclusions. There are a few motives that were brought up, but none that would ever lead to like such none of them a really hold crime. water. Yeah. Yeah. On the night of January 16th, 1997, Scott brutally murdered his wife Yarmala in oh the backyard God. while their children were asleep upstairs. And it captured national attention because of the defense. What sleepwalking. The t- sleepwalking? Sleepwalking. Wow. Scott is known as the sleepwalking killer. Okay. I can't believe I haven't heard of this case. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear about it until I started. You said 1997? 1997. So I was I was younger. That's probably why I wasn't yeah. looking for true crime at that time. Right. Uh, well, this journalist, Jerry Kramer, who talked a lot about this case, he said he believed it was an interesting, fascinating case and big news because it was a case where we were attempting to probe the secrets of the mind, which is the final frontier of science, while also seeking to probe the secrets of a family because we still we don't, don't know, know why this happened. So let's get into it. I mean, nobody knows what happens behind closed doors. That's the hardest thing. Yeah, I don't know. But Scott Lewis Filater was born September 14th, 1955 in Miami Beach, Florida. He was the eldest of five children in a Catholic family. He was described as a very studious, introverted child. His father was a personal manager and his mother was a nurse. I couldn't find much on his parents' relationship and his family growing up, Mm -hmm. but nothing that would lead you to think like, okay, there's a possibility he's going to be a really bad guy in the future. So no big trauma. No, Seems like not a pretty that I normal find. upbringing. Yeah. Not that I can find. Yarmala was born Yarmala Marie Kleskin on February 5th, 1955 in Berwyn, Illinois in Cook County. She was also raised Catholic. Sadly, other than several comments about Yarmala, I couldn't find much on her life growing up before she met Scott. I wanted to bring more of her to the story, but because of the sensation of her husband's defense, there was just very little written 
about her in general and who she was as a person. That's so sad. And it, yeah, it's it's fucked up. Unfortunately, that happens in so many true crime cases where they focus on the yeah. the monster that committed the crime yeah. and we lose sight of, of the, victim. the poor victim. There's literally almost nothing about her. And I I went into the depths to just find I, believe, I know you did. Somebody sure. talking about her other than just a few comments that were probably heard in trial and like in interviews, there's nothing. The only mm-hmm. thing that I do know that was pretty personal to her was that people would call her Yarm for short. So she had a cool little nickname, which a means she's probably name. a fun person, you know? <laughs> she did look pretty fun. You're going by Yarm. So Scott and Yarmala met in high school at Riverside Brookfield High School in Riverside, Illinois, and they met in sophomore English. He was attracted to her because of her intelligence and spunk. And Yarmala thought he was funny at first because she noticed that he had a habit of dozing off <laughs> in the middle of the day in class. <laughs> She thought it was endearing, I guess. Um, until he sleepwalks later. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But they were enamored with each other and earned the title of cutest couple. Aww. And they were named the couple most likely to get married by classmates. Scott's sister, Laura, later said, if any two people were meant for each other from the very beginning, it was those two. Yarmula was the only person Scott had ever dated in his entire life. He had only been with her. His mom said in an interview that Scott was never much of a kid that went out on dates, but he saw Yarmula in school and high school and he decided that's the one he liked. So he asked her to go out and that was his first date and he never went out with anyone else after that. He wow. chose her and wanted to be with her and she did the same. It seems so sweet. You don't hear these kind of stories that often. I guess in the 50s, it made sense. Yeah. Sounds like my parents. They were born around the same time. Well, back then, people stayed together forever, regardless of any, you know, issues True. in marriage. So and you didn't talk about the issues again, either. There you go. It wasn't on display. Nobody was as open of talking about their stuff as and we And you didn't get divorced. You kept your dirty laundry to exactly. yourself. So who knows? Yep. So they both went to college after high school. They went to different colleges. And he studied electrical engineering and she studied medical radiology parasitology and hematology smart lady she went to she went at it (laughs) yeah fuck yeah they decided to get married but a couple of months before getting married scott ran into a couple of mormon missionaries and both scott and yarmula converted to mormonism with the church of jesus christ and latter-day saints that's a big change i don't know catholic i I think that you would find that that's a very common really yeah conversion conversion yeah yeah and i think it has to do do with something about the afterlife. Um, so, but at first, Yarmula wasn't sold on converting, but they visited the temple in Salt Lake City and they listened to someone speaking about eternal matrimony or the ceiling. Okay. Which means that the marriage doesn't end once you die. You continue to be with your husband or your wife in heaven. So if that is what convinced her, she was obviously madly in love with this guy. Yeah, right. They decided that's to be something that forever. they wanted to do. So they took the classes and they were baptized and they're now Mormon. They married in 1976 when Scott was 20 and Yarmula was 21 and they were later sealed at the temple in Washington, D.C. I think all the Mormon temples are so beautiful. Yeah, they're pretty ethereal. They are. They always stand out. Yep. Doing my research, which I knew nothing about this case prior to starting, I mean, something obviously grabbed my attention to look into it, which... Which I'm sure is just the name. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking, killer. yes. <laughs> and that's because of our initial interest in dreams. You know, but, sleepwalking right. was I trying to make some kind of connection. I think when we were first researching, I remember you finding this and I was like, that sounds interesting. I don't want to know anymore. I want to wait for you to do yeah. this episode. <laughs> well, while I was researching, I just realized, wow, I actually have a lot of connections here. So I grew up Mormon and I'm an ex-Mormon now, which I'll talk about right. quite a bit um, just over time because you and I share the similar choice of separating from our religious upbringings. We don't know too much about each other like we mentioned in the last episode. We just know that both of us grew up in a very strict religious household. Yeah and like I wouldn't even call that mine was just super strict but the Mormon religion in of itself does place. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's strict. I think that's why you know as we get to know each other more because I haven't really gone into your religious background with you that much. I mean we really only met three times before starting this podcast and the first two times we maybe had a solid 30 minutes of talking with each other because we were with a bunch of other groups. people we were in groups yeah most of what we've connected on I think is just like relationship situations that we've been in absolutely and then we went out on our first date <laughs> yeah our date Christmas we went time. on a date <laughs> and it was it was like it was. I mean some of you guys can feel Crash this course right <laughs> it's like it feels that way when you're going out with somebody that you don't know that very well and you're mm-hmm. trying to make a new friend it's right. almost more nerve-wracking than going on a date like I feel like I well, care more about what a friend you know another woman thinks about me exactly. than a dude <laughs> Like when you're, I don't know, just being at this age, you want to have like really good friends and like 
there's some women that I grew up with and I will always love them, but we're not that close anymore. And yeah, your life's changed. Take everything's different paths, changed. You know, and you just want that. You know, you see those people who have like best friends who they do everything with and all that stuff. And I'm like, that would be cool. But life's already like, I don't know if I have time for, <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't have time for that kind of wife friend. <laughs> right. But you want to, you want to make friends as an adult. Yes. And so I, I don't know what I can say is like, it took me one second to like you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, Oh, wow, this is a girl I want to know. It's like <laughs> this was meant to be. Yeah, I think we're, we're soulmates. Just, we're just drawn to each other and it's been pretty seamless. Yes. We just get each other. But going back, like anyway, another connection for me with this story is my mom and how we kind of talked about it for a second. She was raised Catholic. Oh, she went to Catholic school yeah. and she converted to the church after meeting my dad. He grew up Mormon. So it is common to convert because you meet someone who's already in that religion. But mm-hmm. I think what's very interesting about this story is both of them chose to convert to religion together. And I think it just came down to they were very educated, you know, and right. maybe they saw a better option with the, the afterlife and stuff. And they wanted and, to be married forever, it sounds yeah. like, which is I mean, pretty, he chose her and he had never been with anybody else. Very romantic in a way. Yeah. Until you know what happens at the end, I guess. Yeah. Sadly, the end is it's not somewhere you want to end up with yeah. everything that they, you know, everything that they built. Um, Another little fun fact, and I didn't learn about this until recently, I want to say with like in the last two years, apparently, and if you know anything about Mormonism, it was founded by Joseph Smith. Did you know that? I do know okay, Joseph Joseph Smith. Smith. Everybody watched... knows the name, I think. And so everybody so, can relate that to Mormonism. The main thing I know about Mormonism came from South Park. So <laughs> yeah. I think we learn a lot of things from <laughs> South Park and The Simpsons. And the Book of Mormon. I've seen that show. So yeah, I'm sorry to anyone who follows Mormon religion. I'm not making fun of it. But that literally is where I learned some of the things about the religion. Yeah. And I mean, growing up, I, I had to hear a lot of different things from my friends who were ignorant about certain things about, you know, not their fault. Right. But I just remember like just the silliest of things being asked of me when they would find out I'm Mormon because I was pretty normal growing up. You know, Did they ask if your dad had multiple wives. I think that, that's, that's always, always the thing. thing. Yes. And that those are the the extreme <laughs> fundamental. Yeah, they're, they're not part of the Church of Latter day Saints. Like that's not what mm-hmm. it is. But like one of the biggest ones I would get was like, you sacrifice sheep. What? And I was like, uh, no, no. <laughs> I, like, I would, like I, I would even stop and I'm like, how would that fit in anywhere? I'm like, It'd be way more. We dress up in dresses and we go to a church and we go to Just Sunday like class. Else. I'm like. I don't remember seeing a table of blood and you like anywhere. you should like <laughs> you should have fucked with them and taken them to your basement where your altar was or something at some point when I was like a young teenager whenever anybody would ask me that I'd be like no but I am the black sheep <laughs> <laughs> I was the black sheep of my family the, yeah. okay we're gonna talk about that sometime wow look more connections <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, the reason why I brought up Joseph Smith is I found out within the last two years that I am related to him. I think everyone's related to him in Mormonism, right? Oh, uh, ha, ha, there you go. Uh-huh. See, look at me. It can't bring out the stereotypes. It's not all from that. No. Okay, but my family has a book that goes back to show our family tree. That's really cool. I mean, all joking aside. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know all the details. I'll probably be crucified by some of my family members for not even knowing. But I remember someone saying something to me about it a couple years ago. I called my mom. I'm like, we're a Related to Joseph Smith and she's like yes dear why was I not told this it's so weird does that get you some like special privileges no and if anything if we're related and he's looking down at I'm he's my he's ancestor disappointed. yeah <laughs> I didn't decide to follow his ways so that's interesting maybe that's who's in your house maybe he decided that he also doesn't agree with what he put together and he's proud of me maybe <laughs> I doubt it mom I love you my mom is still very devout and you know but that is like I'm never ever going to question someone's religion me neither and I don't but I should all for it I should also be respected for mine like even just we were here last time I know I'm going off of the story I'll try and like sum it up when we come back back. (laughs) I was here last time and we were leaving and I was approached by Mormon missionaries in front of your house and which which was new to me because I grew up with missionaries being around but I was always part of the church so whenever they would show up to wherever I was living like I expected that in a way because they always want to come and check on you and stuff like that but right. to be approached by two men on the street at a, in a random place that I didn't live yeah that it was, was a little it was, it was a little weird for me and I like I do every time it's because they find out I left and then I have to give my reasons but at the same time I don't have 
to. Like those are my personal decisions, and and you should not have to like what's the word I'm looking for. I don't have to justify justify. Anything. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to justify anything to them, but it's just one of those things because they're always young kids, and, and you, you know, and they nice. grew up. At, they grew yeah. up in the church, and they're nice, and I don't want to be mean to them. And but you know, it's like I've I've had the same conversation probably a hundred different times with people about why I left, and all I can say is that I have reached my heightened level of connection with God, spirit, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it, being outside of any type of religion. Me so that, too. So I feel like I was more free when I got away from the, I hope we're not getting somewhere. I don't, I don't want to <laughs> offend anyone, but about. like, I just always had this inquisitive mind. Like I couldn't just take what was mm-hmm. told to me because my family believed oh, I that. No. I had to go out and explore it for myself. And so I did realized I. I didn't believe in the same way that they did. And there's nothing wrong with what they believe, but it's just no, not what fits no. for me. It's just when people shove stuff down your throat. Yeah, I can't handle that. Like even when I, I wasn't ready to let go of religion completely when I was a teenager, I went and I literally spent an entire year being part of different churches just to see if something would resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And there was one that almost did, almost. But the topics are what get me. Because if you're going to sit there and you're going to preach about something for an hour and the topic is just not something that I'm comfortable with. I went to this one church that was very, very popular down in New Mexico. And I think a lot of people go there now. I decided to pop in on a really fun day. The entire topic was about how bad Mormons are. Oh my goodness. And I was like, wow, this is wow. You're supposed to be. And that's something that the Mormons do not do. They do not ever bring up another religion and claim superiority or anything like that. And that's the one thing that I felt by the time I was done. I was like, I'm done with religion. I feel like the Mormon people had more respect for other religions than any other group that that I was a part of. And perhaps going back to the story, that's part of the reason that Yarmula and Scott yeah. left Catholicism that might because be it. Catholicism is pretty judgmental. Yeah. They tell people they're going to hell. And Mormons are more about and like Mormons don't are drink more coffee. Accepting. Yeah. And so. I love coffee. Sorry. <laughs> like, Me I'm too. not going to be judged. And alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, going back, Scott and Yarmula got married after all, and they had two kids. Megan, she was born in 1981, and Michael, he was born in 1984, and they had both of them while they were living in Florida. At some point in the 1980s, they moved to Minnesota for a few years and then they moved to Arizona in 1987. They moved to Northeast Phoenix in Maricopa County which was considered to be a good area. It wasn't very high crime. Mm -hmm. They moved to Phoenix because of Scott's job as an engineer for Motorola. So he was doing very well in his career. Yeah, he was a big guy where he was. They became very involved in the LDS community there. Well, there's a big LDS community in Arizona too, right? Yeah. I think I've heard that. So um, they became very involved in the church and in a big way. So so Scott grew up Catholic. They converted and Scott just really loved the church and he became a seminary teacher for the local high school students in the morning. I've heard of seminary, I think mostly on the Catholic side. I didn't realize the Mormons had that too. Yeah. If anybody doesn't know what that is, it's really just Bible study, but it's for us anyway, it was 14 to 18 mm-hmm. um, and you read the scripture and you learned about different things and it lasts for four years prior to turning 18 and okay. graduating high school. So he taught in the early mornings before school and he would head home after to take his kids to school and then head into work. Okay. Uh, busy Yarm- guy. He's a busy guy, yeah. Yarmula became a stay-at-home mom after Michael was born and so she cared for the home and the kids, which always makes me sad being an independent woman. I was like, look at what she was going to school for. Right. It was pretty crazy. And, then and I hope she didn't feel off. like she had to be a stay-at-home mom. But well, and you know, back then, sometimes if, in the 80s, if he yeah. could provide, it was expected. That is true. You know, I grew up in a household where both of my parents had to work regardless. Me too. So I don't know what that was like but if he had enough money to pay for everything who knows we don't get to ask her and there's not enough about her online sadly well hopefully it was her choice I hope so let's believe that (laughs) yeah she did love her kids so so now let's get to the night of the crime on the night of January 16th 1997 Scott and Yarmula were 41 at the time Megan was 15 and their son Michael was 12 okay it was a typical morning for the family Scott taught seminary in the morning and then he came home to take the kids to school he worked a full day at his job and then he came home to have dinner with Yarmala and their kids. Before dinner, Yarmala asked him to go work on the pole pump in the backyard because she was afraid that the water was going to turn green. Okay. So he worked on it for a little bit, but he was called in for dinner. At dinner, he discussed work. He 
was really stressed with the possible cancellation of a chip project that he was heading, which would mean all of his staff would be laid off. And okay, so, so that's stressful. it was really weighing on him. Yeah. From what it seemed, he was a really good boss, too. Lavana Mullins, she testified that she had never had a better boss than Philater. Okay. If she had to name the top five bosses she had, Scott would be one, two, three, four, and five. Wow. So There's nobody who comes close to his attitude and the way he treated people. But it, it's hard. I feel like compassion is different. That's not, compassion doesn't mean super nice. I don't know. True. I feel like it's a fine line. You mm-hmm. never really know where the psychosis comes out of people. Right. You could just never know somebody. And I just, to me, I hold on to that throughout this entire story you just can never really you know don't anybody know someone no steep yeah exactly so after dinner he worked on his computer for a while he was preparing for his lesson the next morning for seminary class overall he was spread pretty thin with everything he was doing at about 9 p.m he decided he was going to go and try and work on the pool pump some more which was the same time that the kids went to bed he went out and tried but the o-ring was so old it got stuck so he tried to dig it out he wasn't able to do it he couldn't see well like the sun was That's going late. down yeah. he got frustrated and he decided to go to sleep. Okay. Yarmula was asleep on the couch with ER on the TV. <laughs> I remember that show. <laughs> I was so obsessed with ER. Yes. George Clooney. I still have all of the DVDs, like all the season sets. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Anyway, he woke her up. He kissed her goodnight and he told her he'd fix the pool pump the next day. Doesn't was, sound like a guy planning no. anything. He was exhausted and he crashed between 930 and 10. Okay. And this is where everything gets really muddy. Sometime after 10, like before 1030, Scott's neighbors, Greg Coons and Stephanie. Stephanie Reedhead, Ridehead. I think it's Ridehead. R E I D. Ridehead, right? Ridehead. Could be Reedhead. I'll just call her Stephanie. Reedhead. It could be any. Reedhead. Yeah. yeah. I should have looked that up. Sorry, Stephanie. Anyway, Greg and Stephanie heard some noises coming from the backyard. They were getting ready for bed, and Stephanie heard moaning or crying or something. Okay. At first, to her, it sounded like sounds of lovemaking, which was odd, you know, knowing <laughs> their neighbors. So she asked Greg to go take a look. <laughs> I was like, really? But curiosity always gets the best of us. He looked over his cinder block wall and saw a woman he at first didn't recognize her as Yarmala okay rolling around on the ground several feet from the pole initially he thought that she was drunk or something but then he saw Scott upstairs through a window he walked by the master bedroom window into the bathroom then walked out of the bathroom seeming to wring his hands from washing them okay and turned off the bathroom light he changed his clothes Scott turned off the light in the master bedroom and headed downstairs to the kitchen and from the kitchen to the living room their dog a golden retriever was barking at the glass patio door to the back yard like to go out just barking okay at the glass scott silenced the dog and walked outside to yarmala he saw philater stand over the body for a few minutes and then returned to the house whoa that's fucked up three or four minutes later philater returned to the body at this time wearing one canvas glove and putting another on his other hand Philater stepped over his wife dragged her to the pool stepped around her and pushed her in what at first he thought maybe he was just trying to wake her up you know the uh, whole like if she's uh, drunk let me <laughs> splash water in her face type of thing so let me throw you in the pool like a real really messed up way to wake someone up but then he saw Scott hold reach in and hold her head underwater oh my god so it was at this point that Greg realized what was happening he, he ran to call the police yeah he made his first of two 911 calls at 10 57 p.m. and recanted what he saw while he was on the phone he watched Scott leave Yarmala in the pool and headed back inside and Whoa. back upstairs like completely fucked up like I don't even know it's I don't know how so, I would process that yeah if I looked out and saw that in my backyard nope so the police arrived and found Yarmala in the pool. They tried to assess her first and pull her out and realized the deep red water around her and knew that something was really, really wrong. One of the Phoenix Police Department officers who arrived at the scene, Joel Tranter, upon seeing her said, quote, I've never seen a shark attack in person, but to me, it was reminiscent of a shark attack. Then they saw Scott upstairs through the window walking around. Just, just wandering like, just, around. Just like his neighbor had seen. The patio door was partially open, so they went inside and they met Scott at the stairs. One cop said he seemed confused, while another one said he just seemed out of breath. Okay. Now I would be both. Like if cops were in my house, not You'd only would I be confused, confused, but I think I would stop breathing. So I don't really, yeah. I don't think any of those really mean anything to me. Right. But he's probably think, surprised to see cops that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. But here's the thing. Like we're going to get into it. He was at the top of the stairs in a crisp white shirt and red flannel PJ bottoms asking, what's going on? What are you doing in my house? Why are you here? And, okay. And the cops just kept yelling, show me your hand get on the ground they had a gun on him okay Scott laid down and he was handcuffed he was put in a car while his neighbors came out to see what was going on he was asked how many people 
four in the house. He said four, which would include his wife and the two okay. kids who were upstairs asleep in their rooms. Mm-hmm. They swept the house and found the children asleep. Obviously, his wife was not one of the four he mentions being in the house. No. Because she was in a pool. Dead. Michael, the son, remembers being woken up by a police officer telling him that his parents had a fight, a disagreement. Okay. He thought that that was really odd because he had never... He didn't hear anything, probably. Well, and he had never seen his parents fight or argue, ever. Okay. They went out the front door and then him and his sister were approached by another police officer and they told them that during the argument, their mother had died. Wow. And then the cop just walked away. <laughs> okay. Did they not train these cops on how to have conversations I mean, poor kids, literally kids. being woken up. Like, by mom, the way, your mom's, your mom's dead. dead. You gotta get out of the house. Like, okay. Michael God. later says, quote, I went to bed as a 12 year old kid with a happy life and I woke up to a police officer telling me that my mother had died. How insensitive. And it's everything you think it would be and more. Oh my God. My heart aches for that I poor know. kid. 12. I don't know what I would do. Now, from Scott's account, all he remembers is going to bed and waking up to police sirens and dogs barking. He says, quote, I heard dogs going crazy and I heard all the voices came down and you guys were all over me. God. <laughs> all over me, dude. Like, all over me. I was me. just sleeping. He what was. He said he was just hopelessly confused and that he wasn't 100% coherent in the police car and said that it wasn't until he got to the police station that he was convinced that Yarmola was actually dead. So he... What did he think? I, mean, I don't... So, I mean, well, this brings us to the interrogation, okay, which is interesting. Okay. It was the oddest and shortest interrogation. John Norman was the case agent and interrogator. They thought that he would confess, but they were surprised by his reaction. Scott didn't seem too upset by Yarmula's death and did not weep, but he stayed almost in a fetal position the entire time. Okay. He was curled up in the corner and he was just stunned, disbelieving that he was in this situation. Was he like in shock that his wife was dead or? That's what it would appear to be that he was just like in shock. However, he seemed to accept what he was being told after a quick back and forth with John. Okay. Scott said, quote, obviously you think I did it. I don't know what makes you think that. John said, well, because your neighbor saw saw you drown your wife it. dude <laughs> that's why and scott says oh geez i'm sorry i don't <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i'm making him sound like really like oh man like geez bro <laughs> like, gosh darn it i <laughs> drowned my wife last night he said he didn't remember doing it he claims to have no recollection he didn't deny it he just insisted he has no memory of doing it okay the focus though was not on if he did it because we saw it happen we know he did yeah. it yeah but why so they were trying to look for a motive mm-hmm. they focused a lot on a band-aid that was on Scott's hand. He couldn't remember what happened or what it was from, saying that he didn't remember ever putting it on. Okay. Then upon examining him a bit more, they found some blood. Under the Band-Aid? No. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there might be. (laughs) Probably. So John says, how'd you get that blood on you? Scott said, what blood? The blood all over your neck there. Oh. So Scott like fills his neck. This is all on video. Uh Fills his neck and he's like, I'm sorry, I didn't know there was blood on me. And John just laughed. He's like, because he's just thinking to himself. Like this guy is trying Whoa. to play it off or no something. he's like he just didn't take a good enough shower <laughs> You know, that's what he's thinking is like, you didn't rub your neck that well because mm-hmm. remember, he's in all these clean clothes. So overall, John Norman said that it seemed that Scott knew he was caught in a trap and trying to figure a way out. Scott never looked at him the entire time and he was very evasive. When asked why he did it, Scott said, quote, I just don't know. I loved her. We've been married all my adult life. She certainly does not deserve to die. Uh, She's no. a good wife, a great mother. What will I do? And John said that the story was hogwash and quote, the only thing I believed about his story was that his name was Scott Flater. Wow. And this is a probably a seasoned cop who has oh, yeah. done these kind of investigations. Like so it. that mm-hmm. is Until this day, he holds true to that, too. So he thinks and he's Scott's watched he's like watched his psychopath. own interview over and over again. And he's like, no, he's like, this guy's a cold blooded killer. In the end, she was stabbed 44 <gasps> times before 40? being drowned in the pool. What? I don't even like I can't comprehend that. Like, 44 times. Yeah. Even if you were sleepwalking, which I'm guessing is what his defense is going to be like, that's and even in regular cases physical strength to, to stab <laughs> to stab to stab you sounded like a, a New Yorker girl <laughs> or Boston I, I think there's one deep down in there somewhere I just haven't been there yet and I feel like she'll come out We're when I get go the there. chance to go we have to go there <laughs> but even even in regular cases not that I'm saying murder is regular but 44 times 44. is when it's a crime of 
passion, right? And this is Absolutely. a husband to a wife. Like, so you have to, I don't know. I so just, there was no question that he did it. The neighbors saw it. before. And then he drowned times. her. Like, and then he drowned her. Like 44 stab wounds weren't enough to kill her. He's like, let me also I throw mean, her in the pool. Like, that's what why the we're fuck, gonna, dude? That's why we're going to get into the entire thing. Because all of this has argued why everything happened. Damn. Okay. okay. I'll let you keep going. So right now, he's arrested. Poor kids. Yarmala oh my God. The poor destroyed. kids. Um, while preparing for trial, both the prosecution and defense, you know, got to work. For the defense, Scott Flater's attorneys were Michael Kimmerer and Lori Vopel. I think I'm saying those right. Kimmerer said, we didn't dispute the facts that he was the one who stabbed her 44 times. Okay. It was perplexing. Why did this happen? I didn't see what our defense was going to be. We knew he did it, but the question was what caused Why? it. Yeah. At first, they were going to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, mm-hmm. but Scott's family, specifically his mother and sister, had a different option option to present. His family believes that it was because of sleepwalking. They realized how crazy it seems, but they held true to it. It was the only explanation in their eyes. They were outraged at the thought that he was insane. His sister Laura said, quote, my brother is not an insane person. There's no way you can prove that he's insane. Okay. So I think that she's saying that because she's like, there's no way. He'll, but you, he's not going to end up in like, you know, going to a medical place because he's not insane. He's an extremely intelligent boss, all this stuff. Right. Like, you're not going to prove it that way. So as his mother and his sister were trying to figure out how Scott could kill Yarmala because they they were perplexed as well. Yeah, like, they love Yarmala. They've been together all these years. Right. And, you know, they remembered that Scott used to sleepwalk as a child. OK. And but did he do violent things while sleepwalking? Once, he had a violent event once. And so okay. that's what made his sister come back to that. So his sister got on the Internet and got as much as she could before meeting with Scott's attorney. And she presented sleepwalking as a defense. They didn't originally talk to Scott about it at all. They mostly wanted to make sure that it was a possibility. Okay. Um, a lot of people, and that's why I think he got a lot of, like, I don't know, people thought a certain thing about him in the very beginning, but it wasn't Scott's idea to use sleepwalking as the defense. And they think he was making it up from the get-go. Making up the sleepwalking part of it? Or, or like, even in the very beginning, in the interrogation. Until he went to trial, you know, until they decided that this was going to be his defense, he just is claiming he has no memory. He has no recollection. He does not remember doing okay. it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Scott didn't deny killing her. He just claimed to not remember doing it and couldn't give another reason why would this would happen on the stand later. Quote, I assume I must have gone crazy or that something in my head had broken that night. So, so he, that sounds insanity. <laughs> I know, but it's a one moment, right? So wouldn't yes. that be like more of a psychotic break or something yeah, like some that? Yeah, some kind of episode. Yeah. So ultimately, his defense lawyers felt that it was a stronger defense than insanity and they went with it. Okay. Even though they knew it was crazy too. They knew they, they were Either one is crazy honestly they're about to go and do something you know that hasn't been done that often Mm -hmm. when Scott was told they were going to build a defense around sleepwalking he admitted that he didn't believe it either he said it was far-fetched I didn't question him he said or pushed him too hard at the time but inside I felt that it was just a bunch of BS that it was very simple and pure BS and had no basis in reality it sounded to me like a Twinkie defense I don't know what a Twinkie defense is but I'm just assuming a silly trivial yeah yeah Uh, but after consulting with sleep experts and agreeing to undergo a sleep study of his own at an Arizona hospital, Scott was on board. The argument was going to include that he was really stressed from overwork and lack of sleep, which he was, mm-hmm. and it caused him to sleepwalk and kill his wife. I mean, uh, it's it's a stre- it feels like a stretch, <laughs> me listening to it, but you have to hear the rest of it. But that's yeah. the point is at the end of this, you kind of get to make your own decision. decision. Well, like I've heard of people sleepwalking and like cooking food or yeah, I've like, heard that too. you know, they wake up the next morning and it looks like a raccoon was in their kitchen yeah. <laughs> they were like yeah. going and they don't remember it but I don't know this feels like a stretch I don't I that's the prosecutor's job right to try yeah. and debunk this sleepwalking possibility so the prosecutor was Juan Martinez he was described as a bulldog prosecutor watch out he had never lost a murder case wow that's not who you want no coming it's after not. You. he didn't need to prove motive because the evidence was clear he killed her but by mm-hmm. establishing motive it goes a long way in meeting the standard of criminal intent and they were seeking the death penalty okay okay so they tried to look for any typical clues you know the usual motives money jealousy affairs right but those never emerged no matter how Nothing hard they could find. Juan tried to provide one and he did try using every little thing he could to prove motive for Scott killing his wife but he couldn't so here we are to the trial okay okay the six week trial started May of 1999 and th- so this was about two, two and years. a half two, yeah. about two and a half years after the crime 52 witnesses took the stand 52 52 witnesses 
As of 1999, when this happened, sleepwalking had been used as a defense in about two dozen murder trials worldwide. But there were, at the time of Yarmila's murder, 100 known cases of sleepwalking killings. How many of them were proven? I don't know. Sleepwalking. So it kind of seems like it is this kind of 50 50 situation. So it's been used. Yeah, it's been used. For instance, like Kenneth Parks in Toronto, Canada, was acquitted for killing his mother in law and attacking his father in law while sleeping. He drove 50. 15 miles to commit the act and was acquitted. 15 miles driving? He drove. That one seems even more far-fetched, but That's he got crazy, off. That's crazy, but he got off. So this this particular one is going to come up in a little bit. Okay. So Dr. Philip Keene, he was the chief medical examiner. He found 44 stab wounds on Yarmula and water in her lungs. Most of the wounds were defensive, but some were fatal, including two deep stab wounds to her chest from behind. The cause of death was listed as multiple stab wounds with drowning, though Keene said he wasn't sure if Yarmula was alive when her husband held her head underwater. For a lot of her stab wounds, he believes Scott had his like left arm wrapped around the front of her and okay. was covering her mouth so that she couldn't scream, and then used his right hand to do all the stabbing. So there was thought put into this. He was... Yeah, that would assume thought to yeah he's thinking he doesn't quiet. want the neighbors to hear I mean because all they heard was like moaning right and he came up and from behind her held her and stabbed 44 her. times <sighs> okay maybe he did it inside and then she there's nothing inside everything oh, was out true the blood yeah. yeah the main question became was he or was he not sleepwalking if he was then legally he wouldn't be responsible okay so before arguing that let's look into the facts of what Scott was doing during the murder of his wife the timeline and what was found upon searching the home and garage police found a plastic tubbleware container you know like one of those like a large, rubbermaid like one of those large cereal containers you know like oh like how, a, okay yeah, yeah like one of those things it had a hunting knife covered in blood okay his bloody clothes jeans a shirt and socks a mouthpiece a mouthpiece gloves and boots and it was in a black plastic trash bag deposited into the wheel well of his Volvo hatchback under the compartment top I'm sorry but that seems like a very deliberate hide I, I just can't imagine you doing that while sleepwalking like this just seems so complex for a sleepwalking He gathered event. all of the evidence and put hit it, it in a cereal container, put it in another bag and stuck it under a wheel well. Like he car. was going to get rid of it the next day. Yeah. To me the mouthpiece was an interesting thing. Maybe that's just because he was trying to protect himself uh, and that's what was thought from Juan Martinez, the prosecutor. He suggested that Philater m- may have inserted that in his mouth like before he attacked her so that maybe if she was thro- oh, throwing her arms him. around that he wouldn't get get his teeth damaged okay or maybe she wouldn't even damage herself with his teeth because mm. sometimes they've linked stuff back to teeth to marks teeth. well just teeth in general like if they have any damage like you broke a tooth during the attack obviously that's very clear this seems like <laughs> i don't know it just seems so thought out yeah dna samples from the mouthpiece did not exclude the possibility that scott had put it in his mouth <laughs> His mouth. <laughs> Come on, she cannot think. cannot talk today. <laughs> I blame it on my period. Okay, but in response, Scott said, "I have no idea what that's about. It's very possible the thing was just lying around in the garage, and I popped it in my mouth." Um, <laughs> that's what his response yeah, was. Because that's what I like to do. Yeah, let me just stop us dirty things. Ew, <laughs> that's just laying mouth. around the garage. He literally couldn't think of anything better to say. I'm like, okay, now I think he's why a liar. Not, why not just say I don't remember doing that? Stay like keep in line with everything else you said. Why would he even have the mouthpiece to begin with? Did he play sports? Like I don't know. Like that's yeah, something you no have for like that. hockey or rugby yeah. or football. It is it is a weird thing to have. It's a weird like, thing to have around like mm-hmm. wh- where did he purchase it? What how long did he have it? Like I wonder obviously. if his son did something and maybe it was his son's. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I guess we don't know that one. That's a weird. Yeah, yeah. very very odd. So that's weird. Okay. So all of that stuff to me that's proof that he remembers that he remembers everything. Yeah. I'm sorry. Not only that, he showered he washed his hands a separate time he bandaged his hand and he changed his clothes at least twice that they know of once after the stabbing and another time after he drowned her do people shower while sleepwalking i could see a shower happening wouldn't that wake you up so uh, here i'm gonna get to something okay about sorry that, actually um so let's go back to scott's sister and mother when okay. police questioned scott's sister laura she said that he had a history of sleepwalking and was once attacked by scott years ago when they were growing up in Illinois. Okay. She attempted to interrupt Scott as he was sleepwalking through the house. He was startled by the in- interruption. He threw her across the room. So he was about 20 years old when this happened. He was going through finals in college and it was about a month or two before he was actually about to get married to Yarmula. 
Okay. And he was really, really stressed out. He was sleep deprived. She said, quote, he went to bed early that night and I stayed up. I was watching the Tonight Show. He came down and walked out kind of behind me. And I said, you know, Scott, hey. what are you doing? Yeah. And he didn't answer me. And he started walking towards the back door. She thought he was sleepwalking. So she ran to get in front of him so that he wouldn't go outside. Uh-huh. And she like brushed his shoulder a little bit while she was trying to get around him. And he turned around and he grabbed her by the shoulders and literally tossed her across the room. Whoa. And she said he looked just so angry. Like he looked almost demonic. I'd never seen him look like that ever. Fuck. And that's the only time they remember him being violent. But his mother, Lois, told 2020 in a, in a 1999 interview, other times he came down the stairs fully dressed and walked into the living room and he was ready for school, but it was like midnight. <laughs> okay. And she said, and then there was this one time he came down the stairs and he was probably 15 or 16 and he was absolutely naked. And mm-hmm. you would ask him about these things the next day and he would he have no, no idea of how it happened or what happened. And they said it usually happened when he was under a lot of stress. And when Scott was asked about these particular things that they brought up, he's like, I still have no memory of any of those situations. Okay. So after about a year of being incarcerated, waiting for the trial, he agreed to undergo a sleep study. Mm -hmm. Scott was monitored for four nights at the Sleep Disorders Service and Research Center in Arizona. They used a polysomnograph to analyze his brain activity during sleep. The results showed hypersynchronous delta waves. Okay. You talked about these. Yeah, we talked about delta waves in the first episode. So this is a little different. So, but this is a symptom sometimes associated with people who sleepwalk, where there are interruptions in the phase of sleep right before the dreaming stage. So people who sleep normally move from one stage of sleep into the next seamlessly without fully waking. Okay. So like you said, I went through these stages in our first episode. But for reasons not entirely clear, sleepwalkers cannot successfully transition from deep sleep into the dreaming stages of sleep. They get into this disassociated stage of sleep. It's not normal wakefulness and it's not completely asleep. It's this mixture of both. Part of the brain is functioning as if it's awake and part of the brain is not. So the defense brought in two sleep experts, Dr. Roger Broughton and Dr. Rosalind Cartwright. They were leaders in the field of sleepwalking violence. Both testified that they believed Scott Flader did not kill his wife, like knowing that he did it. They believed he killed his wife in his sleep and that he was in a sleepwalking state and that she probably disturbed him and that he saw her as a threat, prompting him to unknowingly attack her. Broughton was from Toronto, Canada, and he was famous for pioneering work in the field of sleep disorders. And he actually did work on that Kenneth Parks the one case that, that I mentioned. Yeah. yeah. In response to these two being involved, the prosecutor, Juan Martinez, said in an interview, quote, I I wasn't a little concerned. I was a lot concerned. They hired two of what I consider to be prominent experts in the field. Right. And so I knew that there was some viability to that defense. I knew that was something I had to combat. But in another statement during his closing statements in this trial, which is pretty funny, <laughs> he started mocking their credentials and he said their resumes are nothing but steps to their shrines of self-indulgence. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, calm down, dude. Okay, like, dude. that's just rude. So, but Dr. Broughton said, quote, Scott's actions were not logical for someone who was awake, basically saying that he would not have had left so much evidence if he... Or blood on his neck. Yeah. Like he wouldn't have left that evidence in the back of a car, a pool of blood. She was still in it and pretend to come upon her the next morning when clearly the house was going to be searched for evidence. Right. So he's saying logically with like how smart Scott is, this doesn't make sense. That was part of his reasoning. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cartwright really argued the sleepwalking defense and is more well known for her involvement in the case. So if you watch like interviews and videos, like she's there a lot. Okay. Um, Even years later after this trial, she still was conversing with Scott for information that she put in a book later that she published. The book was 24 Hour Mind, The Role of Sleep and dreaming in our emotional lives and she refers to Yarmala's death as the pole pump murder so she has her own name for it the pole pump murder yeah the pole pump had nothing to do with it <laughs> well you'll see okay. Scott sent her he was mad because he had to change the pole pump was you'll that the see. motive <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's like <laughs> added why to are you nagging stress? me <laughs> But anyway, he sent, so in jail, Scott sent her dream material for nine years while he was incarcerated. Okay. So to me, Cartwright is just a little bit biased. But anyway, let's, let's see what she had to say. Like she had a soft spot for Scott. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Cartwright believes that Scott went to bed with the unfinished pool repair still on his mind and while asleep, got up to finish the job. Okay. He put on his clothes, grabbed a flashlight and brought a knife outside to cut a plastic ring on the pool pipe. When Yarmula went outside to see 
see what he was doing. She startled him just as his sister had did many years ago and it Mm -hmm. prompted the attack. She said that there is no doubt that sleepwalking occurs, although it is rare. She gave several violent examples of her patients over the years, such as carving up living room furniture with a butcher knife, jumping out of a window, punching through a plate glass door, kicking in a garage door and attacking someone, which is typically the closest person to them. Okay. She said, quote, Scott's case is really about as pure a case as you can find a sleepwalking violence case in its purest form. But why would he have a mouth guard to change a pool pump? Exactly. You know, that's going to end up being the okay. prosecutor's other. It's like there's too many things going on. Yeah. So, but she said sleepwalkers start out to do something related to a stressful event prior to the episode of sleepwalking. If they are stopped, they have a fight or flight reaction. Okay. They do attack and with viciousness and extraordinary strength, research shows that sleepwalkers are not capable of facial recognition, which is why they sometimes attack people that they know. Stress and sleep deprivation are both major contributors to sleepwalking. And then she says all of these cases are full of contradictions. They kill somebody they love. They're very hard to understand the contradictions about his tidiness and untidiness they were both there I mean he left the body floating in the pool and then he tidies up his clothes and that makes absolutely no sense you can't approach it with a sense of logic and neither can he poor soul so like (laughs) so she feels sorry for this guy yeah that's the thing is like a lot of her quotes like kind of made me shiver like I don't know why like I can't explain it it's like she was a fan or something I was about to say is she one of those girls that was like fangirling the guy in prison but the way she talks is almost like she's like almost as if she's at the same time excusing the actions of a serial killer because they can't help themselves because they're psychotic and she's like feeling more sorry for Scott than poor fucking Yarmla who's dead and floating in a pool she had more compassion for him than the act that had happened. That's, yeah. So overall, the two experts cited Flader's family history of sleepwalking, job stress, and lack of sleep as reasons for his lethal actions. But lots of people have stress and lack of sleep. <laughs> yeah. Not all of us sleepwalk. Yeah, I guess. And I have heard, like, I do know of people that, like, lock themselves down on their bed. like Because they'll do things. Because they'll do things. But I'm sure that those are the type of people who do it to protect themselves, right? Themselves and the people that they love. But if Scott was known to sleep walk it seems odd like I don't want to ruin anything but I wonder mm-hmm. did his kids ever see him sleepwalk like yeah I never you would think this I would be something so. that it everyone would up. know it's so odd that only the mom and the sister saw it when he was younger but mm-hmm. nobody else in the whole I mean family. there is one part later and I don't know if I included it actually so if I do I'll be repeating it later but that a friend of Yarmula's does remember having a conversation with her about Scott's sleepwalking okay so I would just think yeah that the family it would be very well known you know if I was growing up and my dad was sleepwalking all the time it would kind of be like a joke like oh can't have friends over because dad might sleepwalk naked naked. (laughs) (laughs) that'd be a little jolting for some nine-year-old girls I'm very glad I don't have sleepwalking issue and if you do I'm sorry like that's really it seems it would be really scary to like Mm -hmm. be doing something completely out of your control I mean some people like start doing really constructive good things for their lives like cleaning their house yeah. If I'm going to sleepwalk, let it be that. Let it be something I'm not going to remember, but like is positive the next day for me. You just wake <laughs> up and you're like, wow. But I wonder if you probably don't feel like you slept. I wouldn't think so. Your body's working all night. Yeah. Doing something. And you're awake. It's just like the part of you that is you is asleep. That so makes you're sense. like a, a zombie. You're a zombie. Way. Yeah. All right. So let's get into what the prosecution prepared. So they okay. started with taking closer look at the facts and how all of what happened was not possible from a person who was sleepwalking. Prosecutors had a strong case seeking the death penalty and they did a good job of using science to prove their case and believe that Scott tried to make it appear that the murder of his wife was the work of an unknown assailant conveniently after the children had gone to bed. Now that's interesting theory. They suggested that Scott lured Yarmala out to the pool, stabbed her 44 times. He then went upstairs, cleaned up, changed his clothes, put the clothes and a knife in his car, bandaged his hand, came down and quieted the dog and went outside to her but then noticed she was still breathing and so that's why he went back and got more gloves and dragged her over to the pool and drowned her I mean that seems 
seems plausible. And he probably, I mean, perhaps he was interrupted by the cops and he still had more to do, right? Well, technically at that point she was dead and now he was going to sleep, right? So the the prosecutors believe that his original plan was to go back to bed and allow the children to find their mother. Oh, because he wanted, okay, I'm sorry, I'm slow. He wanted to then act like he woke up and Mm -hmm. was like, oh my God, someone had done this and we were all sleeping. Yeah. So more specifically, they thought he would wake up, notice she was gone, wake up the kids and all three of them would go outside kind of looking for her mom because she wasn't in the house and then find her floating in the pool, slain by an unknown intruder. The crux is that Scott did not predict his neighbor seeing the whole thing. That, I think that's what I was trying to say is that he had to come up with a different story. Yep. And that's why he seemed so shocked and stunned in the interrogation because he's like, well, fuck, crap. <laughs> So there is one thing that I noticed when I was doing this research, because I just said that, you know, his neighbor saw the whole thing. Well, his neighbor didn't see the whole thing. He just saw the drowning part. But I've heard a couple other people saying, well, yeah, the neighbor saw him stab her. No, no. Like he didn't even see blood from what I could tell. They just saw her over in the dark, kind of laying, like laying and like moaning. And he thought she was drunk. Isn't that what he said? Yeah, she was drunk. Um, So the prosecution also believed that he may have known about the Toronto case and may have known about the sleepwalking defense and that, you know, because he had proof of a sleepwalking history that maybe Scott planned to use this sleepwalking defense as a backup plan. But from the accounts of like his sister and his mother and his defense lawyer, that's not true because Scott wasn't even the one that came up with this. It was them. And then they brought it to Scott yeah, as, so. as a way. Even if he had known about it, that's it, not why. It wasn't why. premeditated. Right, it wasn't a premeditated defense. Prosecutors hired their own sleep expert, Dr. Mark Pressman, to analyze Scott's behavior on the night of the murder, specifically to see if there was evidence that Scott may have been sleepwalking. He disputed the significance of the original sleep test results. He didn't find the results to be very impressive at all, actually, and argued that those kind of waves can be found regularly with patients who have sleep apnea. Okay. And with nearly 40 million sleep apnics in the U.S. as of 1997, he felt that it was not specific enough data to suggest that he was sleepwalking. Mm -hmm. So during the prosecution, Dr. Pressman listed 64 behaviors Scott exhibited during the commission of the crime that were inconsistent with sleepwalking. I like this. Let's hear yeah. more about that. <laughs> Again, uh, they're all the other sources, and maybe it's just because they wanted to round up, say, 65. But in an actual testimony and interview that I saw, he says 64. So he's very specific. <laughs> like right now, I'm trying to, you know, listen to everything. But I, I feel like I'm siding with the prosecution right now. I don't know. I mean, it's already. And that's just our science brains. We're like, well, right. I don't know. But at the end, I think still to this day, nobody you knows. can kind of argue all Both sides. sides. Yeah. I don't know. It's just whatever. I just keep saying it's just whatever. It's not whatever. whatever. <laughs> so some of them included touching the cold water alone would have been enough to wake him up. Kind of like you mentioned That's the shower. What I said about a shower. Yeah. And the reason why I didn't talk about it then is because I was reading different stories from sleepwalkers. One girl, she was talking about how she slept walked and is that a word? She slept walk. Slept walked. <laughs> We're <laughs> she, making it a word. She was talking about how she had an episode of sleepwalking and she woke up in a river. What? Now that's a full body of water. And she was all the way in there doing some stuff before she woke up. Like not just touching the water did not wake like up. Like to wake on top up. of the river. She was inside. She was in the river. So that's the one that they said. And I was like, well... I don't do know. people regularly like get in pools or like that's why I'm like if our listeners if you have any stories and you can yeah, cooperate, I don't know enough like, about it any of this water stuff like is that enough you know we're all different people Isn't maybe that, even yeah. for sleepwalkers there are different things that are not going to wake them up maybe there are not as many consistencies that they're saying that there are right it is a more individual thing um, but they said the sounds of her screaming and the dog barking would have also woke him up I don't know a sleepwalker can't create new memories during an episode Scott's recognition of the need to conceal bloody evidence meant that he knew what he was doing all along. Oh. Scott said that he went to bed with his contact lenses in, then apparently got up, got dressed, took a flashlight outside. Dr. Pressman said, true sleepwalkers can't distinguish day from night. Oh, so that suggests that he knew it was dark outside and both of those pieces of information are something that no sleepwalker that I've heard of would actually know or be aware of. Interesting. But if you go back to what Dr. Cartwright said, that was the last thing he was doing. So maybe I don't think he had a flashlight before because he went to bed because the, the daylight was going away. Okay. So he did grab a flashlight. He knew it was dark outside that he needed a flashlight. But if he was going to fix the pool pump. Well, no, you're right. right. He was fixing it before they, it they was. They can't distinguish oh, day and night. So 
there's one. So anyway, Dr. Pressman finished by saying, quote, I think all of the evidence says he was awake and all of the evidence says his behaviors were far too complicated to be sleepwalking. Sleepwalkers have no need to hide anything because what they are doing, they don't know is don't anything know doing out of the ordinary either. <laughs> right. They're just zombies essentially walking the earth. I think the hiding things in the wheel well to me and that seems <laughs> real off for a sleepwalking incident. And that's not just like he threw it in his car. He's no. like, let me open this. I'm going to stick it under this and it's going to go under there. And right. then it's going to be concealed in two other containers too. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's hard to believe. Uh, so Juan Martinez, the prosecutor, added, after Scott changed out of his bloody clothes upstairs, he put his clothes and the knife in a plastic container with the other items in the back of his car and then cleaned up and bandaged a cut on his hand, suggesting that he was consciously aware of the fact that he was injured and knew that he had to do something in response to the injury. And he successfully completed it. All of this before he came back downstairs to calm down his dog, who was barking at the patio door. Scott claimed to have not heard any screaming from his wife and yet apparently he was aware of the agitation of a pet because his neighbor saw him calming down his dog before walking outside that's yeah that's suspicious as well and so he said an individual who is sleepwalking does not know that the dog is there because remember facial that would include a dog so for him to have quieted the dog meant that he was awake in response to these allegations dr cartwright who was for the defense argued that she doesn't believe he was quieting the dog, but responding to the dog jumping on him. But that should have, I would think, if, you know, his sister touching him. Like, why didn't he kill the dog? Why didn't then? he throw the dog because this across is a the dog, room? Like, jumping, jumping. That's what jumping. I'm saying. Like, his sister yeah. touched him and he threw her across the room. You'd think he would have kicked the dog. Dr. Cartwright said she doesn't believe his auditory system was functioning, but that he was responding to the physical interaction of the dog. She also suggests that he didn't immediately go over to Yarmala's body on the ground by the pool before drowning. But that may have stumbled over her while sleepwalking. And that's because the neighbor said that Scott was standing over a body and looked kind of glazed. Why would he have gone back out? Like he yeah. supposedly fixed the pool pump. Why would he have gone back inside and then come back out? Even in a sleepwalking state, like that doesn't that's make sense. That's the point. It's it's the repeated things. Yeah. yeah. So, but Cartwright, because I'm going to give her her time in court. <laughs> so Cartwright. She's in love with Scott. <laughs> She's going to listen to this. Someday. She's still alive, I think. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. So Cartwright said him coming across her and looking at her, he looked at her as more of an object that was in his way. And she's arguing that that's why he rolled her over to the pool to like he remove move his the, object. He didn't move the dog that was I in think, his way. I think Come in on. the end, she's just Stretching. grasping. Yeah. Because, you know, based on the neighbor's statement, this was the second time that he came out. Didn't just like roll her over into a pool to get her out of the way. He then held her head underwater. He held her under until she he knew she was dead. Like that just... I don't know. And that's hard to believe. This is what ultimately gets everything in the end because of the second act of violence. The only way that sleep experts think that violence can happen with a sleepwalker is that somebody physically confronts them and gets in their way. That's clearly impossible on the second incidence of violence because she's on the ground. She can't move. She's bleeding to death. Yeah. Yeah. She's near death. She didn't get up. She didn't like get in his way. She didn't grab him or try to stop him or anything. And he put his hand trying to stay away from him. Yeah. So because of this second act of violence of drowning her in the pool, which that in and of itself is beyond what most sleepwalking people would do. That's what really got him. Other than the hiding of evidence, he came out, he saw her, he went back and he put gloves on before drowning Okay, come on. (laughs) Yeah, we can only like stretch our imagination so far here. However, after all of this that was said, Scott did have an opinion, which I don't think he helped him. He said the prosecution had people who are not the best sleepwalking experts. They spoke with excessive certitude, in my opinion, which you would only find in someone who doesn't quite know what they're talking about. Um, Yeah, that's convenient, dude, that you don't think they're experts (laughs) because they're not on your side. So when looking for motivation (laughs) to Yarmula's murder, the prosecutors contended that their marriage actually wasn't all hearts and flowers and noted that Yarmula wasn't wearing her wedding ring when the police found her body. But that to me, that doesn't suggest anything. anything. It's nighttime. They're going to bed. Who cares? And maybe she ate a lot of salt the day before. I used to take my wedding ring off because my hands were swollen. Yeah, that's why I was like, that doesn't mean anything to me. No. Uh, Investigators found evidence that Yarmula resented the amount of time that Scott was spending on church activities 
activities. Yarmolo was considering a divorce, they said, and she was apparently feeling worn out by the demands of the church while Scott was fully committed to the church. But there was actually no confirmation of any talks of divorce. And others did corroborate some of her frustrations, but not to like any Nothing like extreme that would say extents. Yeah. He's going to kill his wife. Right. Investigators also found evidence that Scott wanted more children and Yarmola did not. Mormon families do typically, you know, have larger families, but Yarmola did not want more than the two ne- teenagers that she I was had. Say, their kids were 12 and 15. Yeah, they were like, older That children. would have been a conversation you think would have come up years ago. Yeah. I mean, I grew up Mormon and I think about it like I'm one of six, right? Yeah, that's a large but family. But not everybody that I knew had that many children. Mm-hmm. So I guess it really depends on your personal experiences. It's expensive to have that many kids. It is. <laughs> you know, growing up with that many siblings, it's not easy. No. I love you all. <laughs> but it's it's, it's great a, in a lot of ways I'm sure yeah, but yeah is, as a as a parent amazing. trying to support and he was exactly. a single they were a single income household too single income so I don't know what his thing was about having more children I wouldn't even say that it was tied to the Mormon religion but right. maybe just him feeling like he always wanted another or something like that and she didn't another thing that he tried to use it as a motive if martinez insisted that philater believed his wife had committed an unforgivable sin okay and that's why he slaughtered her he mentioned the phrase unforgivable sin alleging that philater had uttered those words during a psychological testing after his arrest martinez tried to claim that the unforgivable sin that he was referring to was because yarmula didn't want to have more children or go to the temple again now that's not true even scott says my own salvation is what is gone and my chance to live with yarm is gone because of this so he's talking about oh. the afterlife he was the one that committed the unforgivable sin by killing her not having not not having more children is not an unforgivable so sin. when he was saying that it was like him talking to himself probably like he yeah he's committed. talking about himself you know they were sealed in the temple and he murdered but her if you murder your was, wife you don't get was, to marry her in the afterlife well that's not like specifically said but he yeah. was questioning that he is now ruined his chance to be with her when mm-hmm. he dies. So unfortunately, this argument didn't land very well for Martinez because once Scott like explained it, it just made sense. Uh, and that's is what it is. She didn't commit a sin because she didn't want more kids. There's right. nothing that says you have to you have five point five kids you have to, to be have Mormon. A bunch of kids. <laughs> The last motive Martinez tried to present was something that was, to me, both sad and silly to use as a motive for murder. And I felt like, if anything, it kind of just played a joke on Yarmala during this whole thing. And I feel like it was just kind of... I don't know. That's disappointing. A co-worker testified that Scott referred to his wife as dumpy. Aww. And Juan tried to use this as a motive, but it didn't really work either because then that co-worker somewhat like backtracked and said, well, I don't know if he actually said dumpy, but he was saying that Scott was implying something along the lines that you don't have to have a perfect woman or perfect girl to be a good mother or a good wife. Okay. But if anything, even what with what Scott said to that guy, he's not implying that I hate Yarmala and she's gross. Right. He's not saying that. She's a stay-at-home mom. Like it's almost probably, like he was defending her in a, he in was a way. Saying yeah. That, yeah, she's not because he's a calling her a good model, mother and a good but, wife. Yeah. So and Scott did immediately disregard that dumpy comment. So that was just another like road they tried to go down. And I'm like, again, calling her dumpy of all words too. It's like dumpy. She's not then going to get murdered unless he had another woman he was trying to move on to and there's no proof of that most men don't murder their wives and they tried to bring I think up Scott Peterson or they tried whatever. to bring up some possibility of an affair but it, it never went anywhere and you would think with this horrendous of a murder if there was another woman on the side or even another man if she had been mm-hmm. having an affair that person probably would have come forward yeah I mean like she wasn't just murdered she was stabbed 44 times yeah you don't let that go if you no. are having an affair with either side you're going to come forward I would think yeah so here we are in the prosecution though but everything the prosecution tried to present as motives for murder didn't hold any weight so there's no real motive that there, we know of but who no knows there's what no was going on. there was no evidence of spousal abuse no one knew them to fight family and neighbors never heard them fight kids never heard them fight overall even the you know the sleep experts were at odds on how to interpret scott's behavior and even Broughton admitted Cartwright and everything that she was saying, she herself kind of proved that they both didn't know all the crucial details and they didn't know about them until the prosecution started talking about them. The second acts, maybe the Band-Aid, like all these other things that weren't brought to their attention before becoming oh, okay. experts for the defense. But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, the motive didn't plan out as hoped, but he he's guilty. He now, killed and, her, we know, for yeah, sure. Yeah, so... And- 
Okay, so now we're just going to get to the witness statements. And this okay. includes Scott the himself. The 52 witnesses. I am not going to give 52 I mean, be a, witness statements. a long podcast. I'll talk about a few of them, though. All right, so many defense witnesses told the jury what a great guy Scott Flater is and what a great marriage he and Yarmala had had. They said that Flater was a mild-mannered, kind, conscientious, unflappable man. Most convincing was Liz Biggs, who was actually one of Yarmala's best friends. Okay. Big seemed highly credible, especially because she wasn't Scott's friend. Biggs testified that they talked about everything and that Yarmala never spoke of problems between her and Scott, though, quote, she could be a very vocal woman when she wanted to be, but Yarmala focused on her family. Like, that's where her focus was. They were geared towards church, and she felt that the two of them actually were a good match. Liz said the Flader's family seemed like the all-American dream, and she remembered Yarmala telling her a few years before the murder that Scott was a sleepwalker. So she died. So, okay. It wasn't anything important or significant at the time, Biggs said adding that Yarmala had described how Flader had rummaged for clothes in a closet in the middle of the night, like asleep, but it, nothing was ever nothing violent. Nothing this yeah. crazy. Another friend once prodded for issues in their marriage because everybody wants... The dirt. The dirt. <laughs> her friend Marcy said, quote, Yarmala never expressed any dissatisfaction in her marriage. I would say, come on, Yarmala, there's got to be something. And she would just say, nope, no, he's just a really great guy. And, but we all lie a little to protect ourselves, to say, especially to our close friends or like other church people. We're not going to talk about that. Say, with everybody. What kind of friends were these? Because if they were church friends, like, yeah, I, you're going to hide that, especially from church friends. Exactly. You know? Because we are all putting on fronts. I mm-hmm. was married for 12 years years and I told lots of people that my marriage was great and yeah. it wasn't yeah. so I don't exactly. put a lot we can't really yeah. use much of it all, at hard. all that's yeah. the thing is you get to the end of this and you're like uh, well you know like yeah. you don't got nothing that's weird um, two cellmates at the time were also brought out as witnesses simply to confirm that they had witnessed him sleepwalking. They testified that they heard unusual activity and that they saw him walking in his sleep. He wouldn't respond to their questions or anything like that, but that didn't do anything to help his defense because no. they're inmates. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, we don't know. Did they get a deal? No, probably not. But they were just <laughs> saying, well, we saw him do it. He does it. Uh, but the most heart-wrenching statements came from his own children. Aww. His son, Michael, said, it was just like any other home. We were happy being together and going places together. He said he was close to his mom and dad. Said his dad was stressed about work and about a meeting that was coming up in a couple of days. Said his mom asked his father to fix the pool pump earlier. He kissed his parents goodnight and he went to bed before 930. So normal night. Normal night. He said he had a very good childhood. Quote, I had a father that worked hard and supported the family and a stay-at-home mom who was always there when I came home from school. I never saw my parents argue or fight or yell at each other. It was a very loving home. Michael also said, I'd like to... So I saw this in a video part. Mm -hmm. He said, I'd like to tell the judge that um, I love him more than anything else in the world and I'd like to be with him again sometime. Trying his dad not to go to jail. Their mom had just died. You know, yeah. so. and you don't hear much from Megan, but she did say that her mom had a really great sense of humor and spoke her mind and that they were best friends. Michael was 12 and Megan was 15 when their mother was murdered. At the time of the trial, Michael was 15 and Megan was 17. She was a valedictorian honor student and she was about to go to the University of Chicago that fall. Both children testified that Scott was a great father and they wanted to continue their relationship with him. Yarmala's mother, who was also named Yarmala, told the judge that she wanted her children to have Scott in their lives, all but with him in a jail cell. So she wanted him to go. She wanted him to be in jail but she knew that the relationship with the children was just as important. So I never got anything about like what she thought about. Yeah, I would be curious, but you know. Because to allow your children to still have a relationship, it was probably a lot of confusion on her part because she knew she knew their relationship to be one way and she doesn't know why he would kill her daughter. But she knows he did. But she knows he did and that he needs to be held responsible for that. Right. And she probably has some doubts just like we do when we hear this. And she doesn't want once again, just exactly. like us, she doesn't know what was really going on in that marriage. I mean, my mom and I, like, I wouldn't have told my mom things that were going on in my marriage. I think it was a shock when I got divorced to her. So I'm the other way. Know. My mom has You're probably heard close. way too many things. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've always felt for my mom because, like I said, I'm one of six kids. She's the therapist for us all. 
as I've grown up, I've tried to not burden her. It's not about any judgment from her. It's to yeah. me, all right, I'm a grown up now. And as a parent, you you feel everything that your child is going through. And I'm like, there's six of us. If six of us that all on. are all telling her all the negativity in our life and everything that's happening, that's a lot for a mom to carry yes. each day. So I've tried to be more consciously aware of not giving everything to her. But yeah. she's very aware of who I am and what I think. And like I said, I, she's still Mormon and I grew up and got out of the church and stuff. But she's had to slowly and does like accept us all for all our fucks and shits and everything else Good in between. Her. And she doesn't judge any like she's I love her. She's the best. But not a lot of people have that kind of relationship know, with their parents. I'm so I lucky. would say Yarmula's mom, maybe that's why she was wanting him in jail. Even yeah, though just to protect the them, yes. but then still allow that connection, you know, mm-hmm. not to like just completely write them off. Yeah. So anyway, after this, Scott took the stand and it was actually Scott's testimony that swayed the jurors to believing that he was sleepwalking. OK. That's and it. that he didn't remember what he did. Most of the time when they take the stand, it's not good. I don't know. No, they, they just <laughs> hang the but he rope was, around their neck. He was pretty convincing and many of the jurors found themselves believing him. So he said things like, she was an excellent mother, really fantastically devoted to the kids. When our second was born, she gave up her career to be a stay-at-home mom. Again, we don't know if that was a forced situation or if she chose that. He says, I have no memory of what happened The one thing I do know is that I loved my wife. I tortured myself a hundred times with thoughts of what it must have been for her when she was being attacked by me. It must have been a terrifying, confusing, and painful experience for her. For sure. Yeah. 44 times. Yeah. There's just no way I would have done anything like this to my wife. I would have never envisioned something like this happening to me. Personally, I don't know what I'm going to do without her. <laughs> but you can regret killing someone after. Oh, yeah, you like, can regret killing. All kinds of murderers will say stuff like that about their wives after the fact. That's true. That is true. There's still nothing. There's you know, still the, no so motive. There's just, that's there's the just no part part that motive. That we that's all the hard know part. of. Right, exactly. But that's where you blend the line from sleepwalking to psychotic. Right. Did they do any kind of toxicology? He wasn't on any kind of medicine or anything? I feel anything? like I did read into that, but it was never brought up any more than mentioning that maybe at one point he might have been on it. But I don't think it affected okay. like this and what happened. So in the end, it took the jury eight hours to convict. It wasn't an easy decision. Their first vote was eight to four. Okay. Eight guilty, four not guilty. The main question that they were trying to answer, was he sleepwalking? Because remember, we have the death penalty hanging over all of this. They couldn't definitely answer that. But then after more talking, the vote was 10 to 2. To them, the hunting knife confused them. And the second act of violence is what stopped them from believing any sleepwalking defense. Yeah. Because a hunting knife is not an everyday home thing. Yeah. And he's not a hunter. He's a freaking Motorola guy. Why would he go find <laughs> yeah. that? If he was going to fix the pool pump, as mm-hmm. was the defense, right? A hunting knife would probably not be the first tool you go find. Yeah. And so that was obviously what they were trying to say. Well, they, he needed something like that to get the O-ring off. And I'm like, but he, he literally walks through the kitchen where there's all kinds to of get other outside. things. Yeah, like I, it, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're claiming sleepwalking and he's just like, oh, I need to go do the pull pump and he grabs this knife. A where was knife the that knife? Was prob- yeah. Probably out in the garage. Right. Like, where would you keep a hunting knife? Mm-hmm. So uh, Jerry Kramer stated that the jury said it defied common sense. It defied yep. their understanding of human behavior. And even though they were willing to listen carefully to the defense experts, they said that strain of credibility just snapped under the pressure of the testimony of the next door neighbor. Simple yeah. as that. And on June 25th, 1999, they ultimately found him guilty of murder in the first degree, sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Okay. So nearly six months later, though, is when the actual sentencing was. So if you don't know anything about law, like you have the verdict, but then there's a a separate trial that happens right. later. So it was actually on January 10th. <laughs> so that's my birthday. <laughs> so I Happy thought that birthday. this was funny because it was just this morning, I think, that I messaged you and I was like, hey, you know, the girls from Orbit, I'm, I don't mean to keep bringing up other podcasts, okay? but... <laughs> 
the girls from Morbid, she was talking, uh, I think it was some kind of listener's tell, and there was a girl who was talking about January 10th in uh-huh. her story, and I went, oh, that's my birthday, and then Ash goes, oh, that's Drew's birthday. Oh my God, <laughs> another connection. Another connection. It, just, it just was funny to me. So the sentencing trial took place on January 10th, 2000, to determine if uh, Scott was either going to stay in prison or actually receive the death penalty. Okay. A lot of friends and family came to testify against the death penalty, including his children. So noting the children's testimony that the Felaters had a happy marriage, Superior Court Judge Ronald Reinstein declined to impose the death penalty and instead sentenced Scott to life with no possibility of parole. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah. He's in there. You know, he did the deed. He's not going to come out and cause harm to anybody else on purpose or while sleepwalking. Exactly. So where is everyone now? Yeah. Uh, To this day, Michael holds true that he can't see his father killing his mother intentionally. Okay. That is not like my father. He said my father was not a violent person. They never argued. It just doesn't jive with what I remember from my childhood. Michael is actually now an attorney in Las Vegas with four children. And in a recent 2020 episode, he said, in the 20 years since I've lost my mom, I think about her every day. I think about what she would be doing with my kids now, what life would have been like and things that I have missed out on. But in speaking about his father, he said, you know, he's still my dad and I hope to always have that relationship with him, whether he's in prison or he's out. There hasn't been any word from Megan to the public in all of these years. It's believed that she may have changed her name and probably has a loving family of her own right now. And, you know, I hope she does, and I don't blame her. I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to be known for that. Her father's murder of her mother was sensationalized yeah. and nationally televised for everybody to talk about for years and, and years. right when she was in that and right when she was about teenage, to go to college yeah, and no, yeah that would be hard so Megan actually has not gone to visit him in quite some time she told him that every time she visits she just feels really bad afterwards and he actually was the one that encouraged her to move on and have a good life And so he said, whether they want to visit me or not, I will go to my grave extremely proud of both of them. And in the same interview that I watched, he was crying and said, I miss them terribly. I love them terribly. And I'm so sorry for what I've done to them. So but he still visits with his son. Scott said, I cannot swear on a stack of Bibles that I was sleepwalking that night. All I can say is that I do not know what happened. And this was in 2021 that he's saying this. Okay. He's still in prison. This is 22 years later Mm -hmm. after the trial. Mm -hmm. But 24. Four years after he did this, right? Yeah. I'm doing my mouth right. 1997, 2024. Yeah, 24. something like that. So he says, I understand the trauma and the suffering that this whole thing caused, and it's on me. There's no one else I can place the responsibility on. It's on my shoulders, and I accept that, and I have to move on. When asked if he has forgiven himself, he said, oh, no, 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 I doubt I ever will. But when asked if he thinks Yarmula would forgive him, he said, I think about what she had to go through that night and the pain and the terror she has to feel. I can't even fathom it. But I believe she would be willing to be more understanding and forgiving of me than I am of myself right now. Yes. Okay. He says he hopes to be reunited with her in heaven. Eventually, Scott was excommunicated from the church. He does not believe or count on ever being released. He Mm -hmm. believes he will stay there. So today, Scott Filater is inmate number 148979 in the Yuma Prison Complex Cibola Unit in San Luis. Aside from one incident in 2004 when he disobeyed an order, Scott has behaved himself in prison. His work assignments have included teacher's aid, tutor, library aid, data entry clerk, and porter. Currently, he is not working. He is in medium custody, which is one of the four classifications in the Arizona state prison system and is the lowest level of custody. He has been classified 20 times since 2000 and was determined to present low or lowest internal risk factors. He said currently he practices meditation, gets plenty of sleep, and that he's gotten letters from other sleepwalkers. He said he encourages anyone with a sleep disorder to get treatment. Okay. You know, but he still doesn't know what he did. He still doesn't know why he did it, how it happened. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Real quick, here's another couple interesting tidbits I wanted to share just now that we're in the present. So Juan Martinez, remember, he was the bulldog prosecutor. He is no longer practicing. He did go on to win other high profile cases, including like Jody Arias. Have you heard of her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to cover that one. too. Yeah, that's an interesting one, too. That's also related to the Mormon church. She brutally murdered her ex-boyfriend. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy story. Another time. 
he's no longer practicing because he faced allegations of ethics violations and sexual harassment of female law clerks in his office. He denied all allegations, of course, but he was disbarred in 2020. Mm. You can be good at your job, but some men just, just can't don't, don't say not things cross to women. Line. Just don't say it. Just keep it in your head. Keep it in your head. We don't, definitely don't touch us. Yes. <laughs> we don't want your fucking advances. Thank you. We will touch you. And if, we if want we're you to touch nice, us. that doesn't mean shit. It means we just want our job. Doesn't mean we think we're. I'm just talking about in general. If yeah. I am nice to you, it's because I'm a nice person. I'm not just. I'm not flirting. No. I'm not. Yeah. No, it gives you zero permission of anything. Okay. So I asked my mom if she remembered this case. Okay. You know, because it's 1997. I was young, but had I just been sitting there, maybe I would have remembered it. I don't know. I honestly don't have a lot of memories from my childhood. I think I need to see somebody about that. I've talked about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But they were Mormon. And so I'm like, wow, this was national news too. You know, so I thought she might remember. And she said, oh, yes. I remember. She's like, I remember that. And she's like, I don't care what they tried to do. He did it. He needs to be punished. Yeah. Yeah. Sleeping or not, he brutally murdered his wife. And there needs to be justice and he, for her. I agree. And he could be a threat to society. If he doesn't remember brutally stabbing the woman that he loved more than anything in the world and drowning her after, like, mm-hmm. what else is he capable of? Exactly. So I guess here are my final thoughts on the thing. So I concluded this all for myself. Okay. You know, he has a sleepwalking history. It was verified. He was able to have a sleepwalking study done. Sleepwalking. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Sleep study. Whatever. Yes. He had a sleep study done and he at least was in that range, even though this other sleep expert said, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Everyone's in that range. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But... Just like we brought up earlier, there's just things that we're never going to know about someone's relationship. And even though the kids are like, oh, they never fought. Maybe they were good at hiding it. Children are not aware of everything. I'm sorry. You know, even though they were teenagers that usually can pick up, I guess, more on those types of things that are like that. But I grew up Mormon and not to bring up Mormonism, like bring it into my parents' relationship. My parents' relationship was not all rainbows. But at at the time, at the time of being a teenager, (sighs) I could tell the unhappiness, but I didn't know any difference because they were married and I just thought married, if you're married, married sucks and it's just part of life. You know, that's kind of how I saw it. There wasn't like abuse or anything, but I'm just like, oh yeah, you get married, you have six kids. What is there to be super happy about? (laughs) (laughs) Why would she smile? And they're they're working, you know, we're middle class, like nothing is. And I just love how every time they talked about the kids or even like the friends of Yarmula, they just said, yeah, it always focused on how he just worked and provided for the family. It didn't, to me, it didn't sound like they were. It's very like 90s and 80s. That's what I'm saying. Like where they just staying together because that's what you do because you got married. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd been together since they were 14 or 15. Yeah. Who knows what was going on? Who knows? And if maybe there was a motive. Yeah. I that think I'm there was, like, and he's not going to admit what that motive was, and they can't find no. it because back then there weren't as many like internet trails or anything. You know, 1997, the internet was new. If anything was going on, there there weren't smartphones. Like yeah. there's there's not as much technology for them to trace things down and find out. You know what was going on. He was only 41. Think about that. And she was similar age because they were both they born were both in the same age. They were yeah. both born in 1955. It was it was in January, so she hadn't turned 42 yet. Right. So 41. I mean, that's my that's age. A, right. I'm 42 right now and so I'm, and I'm close so I'm like they were young they were still very young and they had kids and yeah I don't know this and they just... had kids really really young too you yeah. know but maybe the reason I'm saying this is because he's 41 he was very very busy up to that point midlife crisis. maybe this was his well maybe midlife crisis but maybe this was his first true act of doing something Maybe there was something very, very dark within him this entire time. Yeah. And because he got caught, he never got to do it again. We'll never know. True. Maybe this was his first act and yeah. he was, yeah, harboring something. I don't. Maybe he was stalking people on the side and nobody knew. Exactly. Who That's what knows. I'm saying. You don't fucking know your neighbors. No. You do not. And it's always, I mean, you think about some of the most famous serial killers out there Mm -hmm. a lot of them are described as being upstanding people until you find out yeah exactly brutal murderers or rapists or anything like so regardless I do not believe the sleepwalking there's just way too much of that happens it was too complex it was way too complex and it's really simple. Second of, second act of violence, hiding all the evidence, very Come tidy, yeah. changing your clothes multiple times. No, he just didn't realize he was going to get caught by his neighbor looking over. Right. He thought he had till the morning to figure everything out. Yeah. 
But here he is, though. I mean, this is 24 years later. He knows he's not getting out of jail. He could confess. So many people don't confess, though. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Even if he doesn't remember anything, to me, it's either, no, he's a dark and twisted guy. He wanted out of a situation with her. Um, He just got caught. Two, he's psychotic. Right. Or he had a psychotic break. Maybe he doesn't remember. It's very, it's very, very possible that he did a heinous crime. He was fed up at the end of the day. He killed her in a brutal, brutal way and he right. blacked out. Yeah. You know, and he actually, he's telling the truth and that's why it's believable because he actually blacked doesn't out remember the act of murdering mm-hmm. her. You know, I don't know. Overall, he's a very intelligent person. Yes. And, sh- and so is she. But I have one more question to bring up because I didn't see anything in it when I was researching the entire time. Okay, what's that question? The kids. Are they just really deep sleepers? They were he, really they were asleep the whole time. He surprised but, her. I know, but the dog was barking inside the house too. You're and right. he was going up and down the stairs. And so my question is, were they drugged? Ooh, that's a really So good that's question. another layer to the story, you know, like how were they both asleep that deeply while all of this was going on? No way. And my, yeah. they fell asleep at like nine to nine thirty and this is happening thirty minutes to an hour later. That's when you're in your lighter kind of state. You're right. Sleep. So something might have woke them up. So maybe I don't know. Did he slip something in their food at dinner and they both fell asleep? That was never looked into. And Yarmula Wright was laying on the couch. And she was asleep. She could have been drugged too. And they didn't look into any toxicology. All he had was blood on him. I never saw anything about scratches or anything. Maybe she fell asleep. He dragged her outside, stabbed, stabbed her, stabbed her tons. You're right. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of holes. There were in no the defensive story. wounds towards him. And Not, like, think no. about it: if Mm-mm. you went out mm-hmm. and you surprised your husband I mean, sleepwalking, mm-hmm. and he starts stabbing you, you're going to scream. You're going to fight for your life. And the neighbors, I would think, would hear her because she would have been like, "Oh my God, what are you doing? Wake up!" Before like, he something. had a chance to, because the two really big stab wounds were on her back. Yeah, and so and they're they saying heard that her a lot were moaning, too. right? Yep, but mm-hmm. they didn't hear her. And it was being enough stabbed. for a neighbor and another yard to hear moaning like she was but he thought she was dead and he went upstairs to get clean and then I wonder if he heard her and well then he finally maybe came out of the shower got his you know got changed the clothes like oh crap the dog's barking yeah and why didn't the prosecution think of this like I never saw in anything that I read anything that I was listening to but I'm like okay how did the kids not wake up with the dog barking with the dog barking and he had no defensive wounds he had that little cut but what was that from? He cut himself with the hunting knife. Maybe. Probably, maybe. Probably when he was stabbing. I don't know. It. I feel like most plausible is he did it on purpose or like you said, the blackout. Yeah. Psychotic. And he's whatever. just remorseful and he's stuck in jail and he still loves so his many kids. People, and yeah. now he's making the best out of his situation. And he may still love his wife now. You know, he could have for what whatever the motive was. He was really angry in the moment. But right. after you kill someone, all of a sudden you're like, oh, it wasn't that but bad. I don't want her to so be dead. Many- it was so brutal 44 to keep going I mean he could have really just been so angry with her he felt like he was doing everything and he was working and he's doing the church stuff and you know and at the end of the day he comes home from all of that and she's like go fucking work on the pool Pool pump that was maybe he was just that was what that was I was gonna say that was the straw that That broke everything he was like he just fucking pool pump you ungrateful wife but he knew he couldn't do anything about it until the kids were asleep I mean people have killed for less I guess yeah I don't know I don't know I think I'm glad he's in jail yeah I think he deserves to be in jail he definitely killed her yeah there's no question about that and if he killed her while sleepwalking I still think he should be locked up somewhere if it wasn't jail in a mental institution whatever like exactly you can't trust you can't trust if he's gonna just go around stabbing people 44 times and drowning them and saying I don't remember like could you imagine do that like think about his kids they have kids of their own now I wouldn't want my parent coming over and hanging yeah. out with my kids to be capable, capable of yeah. that. So I side with the daughter. I'm glad she's kind of separated herself because maybe because she was older when this happened, she is the one looking at it from the sides of maybe there's something I don't know. And I love my dad, but I don't know if I can trust him now. And right. And she was close to her mom, too. Yeah, she loved her mom. It's hard to forgive. So... And she feels like she's doing her mom a disservice to continue having this relationship with him. Because either way, Yarmula didn't know why she was being murdered. No. To me, he snapped. Whether he remembers it or not, it was something deep within him that caused him to do that. Yep. And And he he could do it again. Yeah. And he can't be out. I don't think he will get out. 
Well, this was a really good case. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> like for our first true crime. Yeah. I think it was a really good one. I had never heard of it. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't know. And I, don't I love know. that. But we can theorize all day long. Yeah. Go back and forth. I guess let us know what you think. We would love to hear from you. What is your opinion? Was it sleepwalking? I also want to hear stories about yeah. sleepwalking. If there's anyone with some crazy stories to help us decide. I'm so glad I'm not one. Really. <laughs> Me too. Life's already too stressful. <laughs> I would fall down the stairs and break my neck. That's what I think. I'm already too clumsy as it <laughs> is. I saying. go to bed. I'm covered in bruises. I don't need. I'd wake up. I don't up, need zombie like, me yeah. doing things. Too. No, no, thank you. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode. It was fun to research it and it was a little bit different. And we do want to bring just a variety to you. So if you like that, let us know. We'll get into our socials a little bit. We have Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And you can email us any of your listener stories. Again, we want to hear about anything that you have to say. And on our socials, it's under Lucid Lab Podcast, all one word. Yes, thank you. All of those that Jessica just mentioned. Yeah. (laughs) We try to make it real easy. Everything is Lucid lucid lab podcast yes there's no abbreviations or anything odd or off anywhere but yes we're still wanting those listener stories because we're going to be doing a listener tale soon we still don't come up with a name we're we'll bad have at that this hopefully next time so what have we covered so far we've covered dreaming and we've covered the, the stanley. stanley which is paranormal and ghosts and right a bit of history and stuff like that and now we've done scott philater yes and this is true crime and murder some crazy questions you know mm-hmm. sleepwalking and just a bunch of topics but we want to hear anything that you have to say yes. we really do like we want to get into them and start including them in our absolutely episodes. and the so. best place to send us those stories is our email mm-hmm. which is lucidlabpodcast at gmail.com yep. or if you want to send us anything you can send a snail mail at p.o box 251 east lake colorado 80614 and then we do have a patreon anyone who wants to support us and allow us to keep bringing this podcast to you thank you we want to see that grow too because that's just a different way for us to be able to start doing other things too like we want to start mailing things we have so many things in line that we want to do with this podcast and I know we just started we do we have a lot of big plans we envision a lot we do we have big big ideas and plans so stick with us and thank you so much thank you for listening and in the meantime stay lucid bye See you later, alligator. (laughs) Bye. Bye.